showing up at this odd time for the talk. I'm sorry about the arrangement here, but the meeting that was in here prior to us, they're continuing tomorrow and they want this to stay the way it is, so I think we can work around this. Um, there is a colloquium next week, it's going to be on Wednesday, and it will be at a regular time rather than this odd time. And then one more colloquium before Christmas, which will be at a special time, which is Tuesday, and I'll send announcements out about that. And I'm starting to get talks arranged for January through May, but I still have a lot of empty spots, so if you know of anybody you'd like to have come speak, let me know, and I'm going to again let Michael introduce today's speaker. And I would like to use this opportunity to thank Mark for running our local film series. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. So I'm happy to introduce our today's speaker, Professor Peter Voigt. And so you will learn a lot about our speaker if you Google the words not even wrong. <laughs> so you will get actually two separate links. Mm -hmm. One will be to Peter's uh, book, Not Even Wrong, uh, where he expresses his reservations about some uh, currently popular mathematically defined theories which pretend to be theories of everything. Uh, I very much share his attitude because originally I detected from one of these theories into the, into the real life. So, but uh, you will also get another link to Peter's blog, uh, which also is titled Not Even Wrong. And this is a blog about uh, issues of general scientific interest. So that material must be, general, uh, must be available to the general scientific public. So our visitor got his bachelor's degree in physics from Harvard, master's and PhD from Princeton, taught at Tufts, and is currently on faculty at the Department of Mathematics in Columbia University. Peter Wade. Thank, Thank you. Thank you. So I was going to start off by telling you a bit more about my background, um, because I'll be talking about what's going on in physics and some, something about mathematics also. So I have a background which kind of mixes the two, two fields. But I realized, with, as I started to talk about math and physics, that there was kind of a third um, subject, which is subject which is more relevant here, which I realized that I had never, um, uh, that I wasn't really sure about, it, about, about the relevance of what I was talking to, what I'll be talking about, to what's going on here. But I did realize that there's definitely a relevance to my own personal history, that before I was interested in physics and mathematics, I was interested in astronomy. And, and I, and I realized I actually had a proof of this. Let's see, so this is a <laughs> <laughs> So this is 1972, just before the total solar eclipse, visible from New Brunswick, Canada. And I was probably, no, that was 1972, yeah, I guess I was 13 or 13 mm -hmm. or 14. Anyway, so this, yeah, so I, I, I did have, a, it's actually the, the way I got interested, so I'll get to start now, but this is actually what got me interested in, uh, in, in, math, in physics and then in mathematics, so, so my, my interest in the subject kind of started with an interest in astronomy when I was uh, at, at that age. So let me get, and now I'll get back to the rest of this story. So then, so then one thing I wanted to talk about was the, the relationship between these two cultures of physics and mathematics. And so my, my, my background started in physics after the initial interest in astronomy when I, I spent a lot of time reading kind of books about astronomy and started reading like books about Know, how you calculate what's going on inside a star. And, and then I started to realize what I actually was interested in me was where these equations came from. And, and then I ended up uh, learning more about physics and then starting to learn about quantum mechanics and being more or less seduced away from astronomy by, by, quantum, by quantum physics. So, so, that, so I started out in, um, in, in, in my career in physics at, at, at first as an undergraduate at Harvard and then at my PhD in, at Princeton in particle theory. And then I had a postdoc at Stony Brook. And then the, um, the next part of it, so, so I then kind of just found out that the job prospects looked a lot better in mathematics and what I was doing. 
um, the mathematicians were much more, it seemed to be much more interested in the physicists at the time. So I started, I started out, first got a job teaching at a calculus at Tufts, and then spent a year as a math postdoc at Berkeley, and then I've been at, um, I've been at Columbia kind of, kind of ever, for, for forever, it seems. And for, first as a non-tenure track assistant professor, and then, um, well, no, and then no, 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 no. permanent non-tenure position. Well, I won't be able to see the... They're not objecting to you, Ruth. Yeah, yeah. Temporary position. I can't They're good. They're all right. That's good. That's good. Okay. Okay, and so, and so, so my, my current position is kind of an odd one that um, I have kind of a non, non-tenure track position now, especially a senior lecturer where um, besides teaching, I'm teaching uh, courses of all kinds, I also make sure the department of computer system runs and do various other things with the department, but that's, that's my kind of odd, odd career, which has ended up much better than I ever expected. Um, but then, so, so one thing that I wanted to, that struck me about this experience of spending part of my time in physics and spending my time in mathematics was that the two fields have very, very different cultures. And it's very much like when I was a kid, I lived, I lived partly in the US and partly in France. And as you move back from one, um, one place to another, you found that you know, people were speaking this different language and they had this different culture. And so they had very different history and different ideas about you know, what was important and how to think about things. And that, so one thing I want to talk about is a little bit about the problems of the, in physics and what they look like from the point of view of somebody who spent time um, you know, in physics departments with them, but also from the point of view of, of what mathematicians, the way mathematicians think about things. And so, so first, <coughs> so we go over kind of the, the history of this. Um, the, 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 the recent history, so, so the, th the thing I don't really have time for, and I think what you normally start out talks about, like this about, are to explain the, uh, what's now called the standard model. So you, hopefully people have seen some description of this, but the basic <coughs> So the fact of the matter is that by, 19, by 1973, at the, long, at the end of a kind of long history of figuring out what was going on, the, there was written down something which we now call the standard model. And that, um, and it's, it's, it's called a gauge theory. It, it unifies the strong, weak, and electromagnetic forces all within a fairly compact mathematical formalism. And, but, and, and that really much was, it was pretty much in place by 1973. And so the, the kind of problems in the field that I want to talk about, what's been going on, is really kind of what happened since then. And this is now quite a long time ago, and the, what's, anyway, I wanted to explain the history, the history since then, not the kind of the great, wonderful success story, which is an amazing success story of how you got to 1973, but how the, um, you know, really having this huge success with this theory, what, what, what it means and has meant for the history since then and for going forward. Okay. And so, so the, the, the after we had this, this, this theory has been kind of um, has been checked and, 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 and a lot of its predictions tested by discovering these W and Z bosons, discovering the top quark, and they most recently by the discovery of the Higgs at, at the LHC in uh, 2012. So I'll say a bit more about that. But the, um, the, the the one slightly unexpected thing that required a slight change in the original theory was the discovery of non-zero neutrino masses. It, it turns out that it's the, um, the simplest version of the standard model is where the neutrinos all have zero mass, but you can, there are various relatively simple ways of extending it to allow the neutrinos to have non-zero masses. And 1998, the first slide of this that. Okay, so, so but the current situation is, um, and very, very odd one in, in, the, in the history of the subject, is that pretty much all of the accelerator experiments that we've done in high energy where we, that used to develop this theory, they're now, um, they're now completely consistent with the theory. They're, they're really, they're, there are no experimental anomalies you know, in these accelerator, exp accelerator experiments. Everything that we've done is completely consistent. Everything that you can see seems to be consistent with this theory. Let's say, give me some, just set some examples of this. So this is a, kind, of, kind, of, kind of a, a very confusing, uh, maybe a confusing uh, agglomeration of, of, of results, but it basically um, shows you measured cross-sections for various kind of processes involving various um, very, various particles in the standard model, and each, and, and in all cases, you can see the, uh, uh, the, the experimental result often in the, in the colors and, and, some, and, the, and the theoretical result according to the standard model, and this, and the kind of agreement between the, you know, the, the experimental, experiment theory is kind of they're completely quite precise for, for all of these channels, for all, for all of this. And there really isn't, um, 
uh, you know, over this huge range of possible cross sections and possible different kinds of particles and possible different kinds of interactions. Is there a pattern to the x axis? Um, the x axis? How you arrange them along the x axis? Um, I, I stole this from someone else, so you'd have to ask them. I, I, I think what they're doing, though, is just by, by, by cross section. It's roughly by cross section. They're, they're putting the, the kind of rarer processes, which are harder to see, in small cross section. Okay, and then the, I mean, the, the great thing that happened at the LHC was the discovery of the Higgs. And so a lot of the work at the LHC is now devoted to the study of the Higgs, to the study of you know, how, does the, you know, how does the Higgs interact with all other known particles. And these are kind of the, the measurement, the results from the first run, um, just taking the ratio between what the theory says. The, intera the um, interaction strength should be with the uh, um, with various particles and what you actually measure, and you can see that this is about what you expect if the theory is, is completely works completely correctly. And, then, and the, these are the kind of numbers that we're going to see over the next few years. There's already a lot more data since this, and within the next 10, 10 years, there'll be uh, these things will be made much more precise. So, one, if you want to hope that some, that the standard model is going to break somehow, and you're going to that you, you, would, you would perhaps expect to see it that some of the, by, by measuring something that's not quite warm here in, in this measure. Um, okay, so, okay, so then the, the other th th main thing that the standard model has done, and I'm sorry, this is really too small to read, but it, it, it's also gone out and done searches for other, um, for, 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 for other predicted, alter for other alternative theories to the standard model that people have been interested in. And try and, and exclude the possibilities of, 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 of the sorts of interactions and forces, forces and particles predicted by these other theories. And so this is actually just a, 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 a long list of, of all the things, of all the measurements people have done going to look for particles predicted by, by so-called supersymmetric theories, which are an extension of the standard model. And then in, in every case, you can pretty much rule out from the LHC data with it and show that these, these things don't exist up to some certain mass limit. And these are the mass limits for all of the, um, for all these particles. And, 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 and one thing to say is that before the LHC was turned on, the people who were kind of enthusiastic about um, the, these kinds of theories, these, these supersymmetric theories, that they were pr pretty much saying that they, they were predicting that, that in all these cases you would be seeing something around in here. So, so these exclusions are all kind of our, our are, are actually quite, quite good, and, and at this point, I think it's becoming harder and harder to find anybody who doesn't, who still kind of holds out hope that by good, if you go to higher energy, you'll see something. Um, and maybe just, just, just as an example, that the but before, before the LHC was turned on, the, um, the mass limits for one of the easiest ones of these things to see, which would be a, a supersymmetric partner to the glue, would be a strongly interacting supersymmetric particle. Um, that, the Tevatron and Fermi lab had ruled this out up to 300 GeV, which was kind of embarrassing because you would naively expect that the series right for it, it, it to appear at some small number of hundreds of GeV. But now the, um, the, fir the, L the first LHC run is, and has ex sort of excluded it up to like 2 TeV, and probably and exclusions will go up to about 3 TeV by the time the LHC is done. So that's, that's kind of where, where that subject is. Um, Okay, so, so then I mean, the, the question is really kind of what, what, what happens next? So the LHC is a, is a machine that collides, um, well, at design energy, two, two proton beams against each other at, at seven, 7 TeV each, so a total of 14 TeV in the center of mass. And it was completed and actually working. Well, one thing I found is, is all of these plots that you find, um, whatever they have to say about Newer accelerators is, is, is overly optimistic about the, the time and energy at which they're going to actually work. So, so the LHC was actually the LHC was actually working by 2010 at this energy, and, and the um, and, and, and the other kind of uh, collider that you you collide is something that collides uh, electrons electrons against um, posit positrons, and that's the highest energy one that's actually operated. It's been was a uh, the left at, at that CERN. And that's those those are those are only able to operate at somewhat lower energies, but they provide a much cleaner um, signature, as much cleaner events. So, so excuse me, what's the difference between the red and the blue lines? Okay, sorry, yeah, I should, I should have said. So, so these these are so these are proton 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 colliders or pro, 
And the, these are electron positron colliders. Okay. And so, so these things, you have strongly interacting particles colliding against each other, so, but, but you can do it at higher energies, but it's more of a mess. But, um, but this is what the LHC does. But the kind of the competing highest energy data that you have is the one from, from, from left from the electron positron machine. This is a machine which has not been built, but let me say more about that. So the question, I mean, a really big question for this field now is, is what happens next? What do you, what do you do? I mean, in the, you have this long history of, of this nice, um, yeah, of this nice increase in the energy of these machines, which is which then gives you whole new regions of energy, of, of energy ranges in which you can um, hope to produce new kinds of particles or see new kinds of phenomena. <laughs> but after the LHC, so so the, the problem is kind of what's kind of the, the next thing that, that really anybody has proposed, there's a, the, there's a proposal to build a, um, an electron positron machine called the ILC. So what's actually happened in the last few years is they've, they've given up on this proposal. It's too expensive, and they have a proposal for kind of half the, uh, to do this at half the energy. And it's still unclear whether the Japanese government will fund this. They probably will decide within the next year or so. If it does get funded, it would be built 2030. So, so, so up to this, the most optimistic thing that could happen to this blue line is to have something out here. That's if all goes well. So you can see that this is that that's definitely turned out. And the um, and then the um, the, 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 the next the, 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 the next most something that's likely to happen with, with um, positron with, with with proton proton machines is that the um, once they've kind of gotten as much data as they can out of the LHC. One thing that you can do is replace all of the magnets that have the LHC with magnets that are twice as strong, and that would give you twice the energy. But, they, but it's probably going to take 20, 20, 30 years from now before you actually see that. So again, the, the kind of best thing you could expect for, for, for the near future of the, of the red um, graph is that you're going to end up, you're going to end up somewhere over here. So, this, so anyway, this was just kind of intended to show kind of the problem you're facing. And, the, and, and there, there are also some other proposals, but the other proposals would involve building much, much bigger machines. And, uh, wait a minute, sorry. Yeah, sorry. Yeah, so, and the other proposals really, um, I personally find it, 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 it's unlikely they're going to happen because you're talking about something that's going to cost 20 or 30 of these billion dollars, which it's very hard to believe anybody's going to do that. I just read they were shutting down CERN for two years or something for an upgrade. Yeah. Uh, but nothing except what it was going to do. Yeah. Yeah. So what's happening right now? So, so the, the LHC when it was turned on, it, it was, the design energy is for set seven, um, seven TV on seven TV, and they found the mag they found magnets were, were they're not quite able to get to that. So the, it, it's been running for the first few years at six and a half TV on six and a half TV. So we're shutting down for for two years to um to, to prepare. Both to, um, you know, um, to anyway, to, to do work on, on the magnets, which will allow them to go to, go to 7 TV, and also to, um, to, 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 to start on, on work, which is going to have some several later stages, which is going to allow a much higher luminosity. So, what's happening at the LHC now is that they're, they're really trying to, <coughs> they, they're, they're, they can't get the energy much higher, only a little bit higher than their magnets, but they can, they can get a higher collision rate, um, but with a higher luminosity. And so the project for the next 10 or 20 years is to, to, to in various stages, try to increase the luminosity of the LHC. And this first two years is the, um, yeah, first is the first part of that project. But there won't be, um, that, that means that in terms of actually results coming from it out of the LHC, it's just been shut down. And the, um, for the next two or three years, you'll be seeing new results coming out, which are from analysis of the data in the last couple of years, which hasn't been done yet. And then it will take. But, but before it will be more than two years before you start seeing new data. Okay. Anyway, and so, and so, and so just to kind of explain what the problem is, the underlying problem is that um, in these proton proton colliders, the limitation <coughs> is, 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 the, is the strength of these magnetic fields. Your, your, the energy of these beams is proportional to, to, the, rate, to the radius of the, of the collider and the beam. And, and, and the magnetic field, B. And so if you want to double the energy, you have to either make the thing twice as big, and it's already like 27 kilometers or something, so it's pretty big already, or you have to double the, uh, 
the strength of the magnetic field. And, and that's actually, that's what they actually hope to do for this um, HELHC, HELHC. But, but the technology is such that, you know, it, it, it's actually going to be going to be a rather hard even to double the magnetic fields of the, of the current um, LHC magnets, M much less go to anything much bigger than that. And yes, yeah, so I guess the current ones are eight Tesla ones, so they propose going to get up to 16 Tesla. What happens if the uh, magnetic field dumps for some reason that's the point? Well, there's a whole, I mean, yeah, one, one of the main aspects of the design of these things is that the, uh, I mean, the, the, the beam is, is carrying some and, well, I mean, these magnets have kind of has, has several different layers of protection again for, for when they quench and for, for what happens to them. And the other big problem is that the beam is carrying such a huge amount of energy that you know if, if, if they just completely lost control of it and it dumped randomly somewhere, it'd be uh, kind of explosive. You destroy everything. So so, that, so they have several different kind of layers of, of protection against that, and that's that's kind of one of the main problems with designing these things. And that was actually the one thing that happened. Uh, um, the the, the IHC took a, a, an extra couple of years say, to get going for what was predicted because basically when they first turned it on, there were they, um, you know, when, when there was an, er, an early quench, quench of a uh, of one of these protecting magnets, the kind of the, the what the, what they had designed that they thought was going to protect the rest of the system against this quench magnet wasn't actually the interconnections weren't done well enough. And they damaged a whole part, a whole part of the machine, and it, it took two more years, two years to fix that and to get the rest of the, of the working. So, so that's a big part of the technology is just protecting yourself against these these huge amounts of stored energy. Okay, and, and then the, now the, the problem for electron positron machines is a bit is a bit different. There, the problem actually isn't the um, isn't the strength of the magnet. They don't need that that magnet that are that strong. But the problem is, is the synchrotron radiation losses. The synchrotron radiation losses go as fourth power of the energy of the beam divided by the radius of the beam. And, um, and already the, the highest energy one that was running so far at LET in Geneva was using 40% of the power of the city of Geneva that it was running. So, and you can see that, you know, so you can see the problem is with going to higher energy, higher energy you know. So you can, you can, anyway, you can, you, you can make it much bigger, but it's only going to go as one or R, or you're going to have a fourth power as energy to be trying to increase the energy. And so, so the, other, the one thing that you can do is you can, instead of, instead of having a circular collider which has a synchrotron radiation problem, you can design linear colliders, which, um, uh, which just do the acceleration linearly. But the problem with these is that, you know, the, basically, the, you know, the beam gets dumped each time you, you know, each time you accelerate it because it's, it's, it's not being stored and circulated. So there's also, a, I, you, um, you get rid of the synchrotron radiation problem, but you still have the problem of kind of this, this thing is going to cost a huge amount to operate. And, then, and then this is a, this is the sort of thing that they're talking about doing in Japan. The 250 GeV machine proposed in Japan would be would be do, would do this. Okay, so that's the um, okay. So, but, but, so, so, so anyway, so, so this is the that's kind of explaining where. Where the experimental problem is, what the problem is with going to higher energies to get um, data about what happens at higher energies. But the the standard the standard model explains you know, all, all sorts of things. But it, there, there are some things which it, which it doesn't it, it doesn't do. What it does, it seems to do correctly. But there's some obvious questions that leaves open, which is kind of what theorists have been spending the last forty or fifty years trying to understand. And one of them is kind of you know just this kind of why question that we you know, you have certain forces caused by these SU3, cross SU2, cross U1 gauge fields. You know, why those? Why not others? Why you only you see certain particles with certain charges and certain uh, interactions with these forces, and why not others? Um, and then and then there's a, a fairly large number of parameters which which govern the theory. There's some small number of parameters that, that govern the kind of basic interaction strengths, but then there's kind of a a rather large number of parameters that, that govern the masses of the various particles and how they interact with the Higgs. And so there's kind of a, besides neutrino masses, there's about 20 some parameters that you really, really like to explain why these random numbers are what they are. And if you put in the neutrino masses, there's you know, maybe another 10, 10 or 15. And, and then, then the, the last problem, this is what has, has 
has kind of motivated a lot of fear in us to kind of been working over the years has been to understand what about uh, gravity. This is the standard model. It's a theory of a particle interactions of this strong electromagnetic and weak forces, but it doesn't really say anything about the gravitational force. And we have a very good theory of the gravitational force. It's Einstein's general relativity, but it's not a quantum theory. So it's a, uh, if you try and put these things together, there's some, one can argue about this, but there's some kind of inherent inconsistency between our best theories of gravity and our best theory of the other forces being, you know, theories of a different nature, which if you try and imagine that, you know, you were in a, you were in a regime where, where, where both of these things were relevant, you would, you, 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 your, your theory would not actually have a, to give you a consistent story as to what, what would happen. And so, 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 now the one thing I don't want to say about, so, so, so one, um, in the kind of ob obvious uh, response to, to all of this is that the, well, you, you, you may, you, you look like you may have to give up and going, going to high energies to, to, to study this, but you can actually study things from other directions. And, and much of the U.S., um, uh, you know, particle physics program is really based now on studying neutrino physics, where you don't, neutrinos you can study at, at much lower energies. It's, uh, to do better with those, you really just kind of, you just have to produce a lot more of them because they, they, they interact so weakly. You can imagine trying to make measurements that are more, more precise, that if you go, that, that the standard model will fail as you make from more and more precise measurements. Um, and, and, and then there's, there's what I'm not much of an expert at, people here probably may know more, more about me, is about you know, using things, or using um, astrophysical phenomena and, and thinking about cosmology and, and, and trying to use those to say something. So, so those are the kind of, I think, the directions that a lot of the, uh, the physicist's point of view, this is a lot of where the, the future of, of this is, is, is just trying to do something in these directions because, because of the problems of, of, what's, of losing this ability to go to higher and higher energies and study things in colliders. But what I wanted to, and, 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 oh, and then one last thing is one, one of the fundamental problems of the subject is that this, this big question of what about gravity doesn't seem to be um, experimentally accessible at all. Like nobody has come up with a, a, really, a really good idea at this point about how to do any kind of experiment that's really sensitive to um, quantum nature of the gravitational force, as opposed to just being sensitive to uh, the Einstein's general relativity. Okay, so now, so, 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 so what are the, um, so, 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 so what people have been doing since 1973 is trying to figure out, you know, how, how can we build a better theory, and or how can we build a, a more encompassing Theory and the thing to say about this, I guess, is that the um, the if, if you want to, especially think about it from the point of view that, that I do as having more of a mathematical background now, you, you ask yourself, kind of, what are the fundamental symmetries of this of these equations and, and, and that are really determining what they look like? And there are these there are these so-called internal gauge symmetries. There's the SU3 for the strong force, SU2 for the weak force, U1 for the electromagnetic force. And then first, there's space-time symmetries. There's the so-called Poincaré group. There's the there's the translations in space and time, and then there's the Lorentz group of rotations and boosts of special relativity. And it, it's these these are kind of the fundamental mathematical structures that govern the, the behavior of, the, of these theories. And so, so one thing people have tried to do, even starting immediately after 1973 and 1974, was to try to explain. SU3, SU2, and U1 by just take, taking some bigger group. Like, so so you know, SU3 means it's you know, three by three unitary ma complex matrices with determinant one. Well, instead you can find fit all these things into some bigger, some bigger group, like, like for instance, SU5, which is five by five unitary ma matrices of determinant one, or SO10, which is um, basically rotations in 10 dimensions, or, or if you like, uh, and the rotations of 10 dimensions, and try, to, and try and explain somehow the, um, the symmetries that we see in terms of this bigger group of symmetries. But the, uh, but, 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 but the, problem, with, the problem with this is that the you do this, you start predicting um, new kinds of phenomena, which are going to be due, due to the, the, mixing, the mixing you've introduced between these different small, these, between things like SU3 and SU2, and, um, and in particular, you, you predict um, a force that's going to cause quarks to decay to leptons, and you, and you typically predict that the proton will, 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 will not be stable and will decay. And so, so one of the first things that people did was go out and measure, as well as they could, the proton lifetime. And, and, and they've kind of, 
that, that tends to conflict with, any, with, with attempts like this. And then, then the next thing that people did, so that was kind of expanding the internal symmetries. The next thing that people did, also very soon after 1973, was to try to enlarge the Poincaré group of translations or rotations by a larger mathematical structure which had, um, which had, had, had some kind of new generators of, of, of symmetries which were, you know, had, which were anti-commuting instead of commuting, and they, so you had what's called a supergroup, and, and this was the whole idea of, of supersymmetry. And, um, and, and so, so the, the problem with this supersymmetry, if you're trying to extend the standard model by saying there's some kind of new generator, new symmetry generators, but, but they, um, they're going to be fermionic instead of bosonic, well, what, what they, what these tend, to, these tend to predict is that pretty much every, whenever you have a particle, if you apply your supersymmetry transformation to it, you'll get a, another particle, but it will have the opposite, um, opposite behavior. If the first one is bosonic, it will be fermionic. And so you have to, um, so, so you can go out and look for such things, but, but, but basically any attempt to do this says that we've only seen half of the, half of the particles of the theory. There's a whole other half out there to be found. And people have been looking since 1977, and that one um, that one slide that I put up there gives you shows you that they're, they're now very very strong. Um, there's a very very strong exclusion of, 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 of any attempt to do this. If you try and do this, you, you, first thing you have to do is you have to explain why the particles aren't two particles that are supposed to be partners aren't quite the same mass, but that creates a huge problem. But even if you do that, you then run into the problem that. You know, there, there, there's nothing out there that anyone has ever seen that could actually be a, a super partner. Okay. Um, so, 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 so then in terms of bringing in gravity, um, it, one, one interest in this idea of supersymmetry was that this was some kind of extension of the symmetries of space-time translation, so it gave you some, some kind of extension of the whole of, of, of the whole of Einstein's gravity theory, and um, this was known as a supergravity theory. And you can imagine that, you know, that a quantum supergravity theory was going to be the theory of everything. And in 1980, in his inaugural lecture as, as a location professor, uh, Hawking gave, a, gave, gave a, a talk called Is the End in Sight for Theoretical Physics? He basically was claiming that you know, a, a, a big enough supergravity theory of the right kind would quantize gravity or explain everything about the standard model and give you supersymmetry, and, it, it, and it, we were almost there, and the end was in sight. That turned out not to work. <laughs> and, and so, so the problem is, is that, you know, there, 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 there's just been no experimental evidence at all for any kind of speculation like this. And, um, and, there, and this also has some internal theoretical problems that, you know, the, there, 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 there's problems you can have in quantum field theories called that infinity is called renormalizability, and um, the, this, uh, the supergravity theory had problems, had these renormalizability problems, and it, and it also, um, the, 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 there's a, a funny fact about the, the, elect, the weak forces that, that they behave differently if our left-handed and right-handed um, fermions experience them differently, and that, that was hard to get to happen in supergravity. So, so, so Hawking's kind of vision kind of had died, died off actually relatively quickly because of lack of experimental evidence and because the theory didn't quite do what he wanted. And then, um, so, so what, so, so the big vision, and this is because of what's dominated a lot of my career, so I got a, uh, I got my PhD from Princeton in 1984, which was actually right around the time that this proposal, proposal took off. And the proposal was to do something dramatic to, um, to, to, to not, to, to, to expand from these Quantum theories were based on particles. Quantum theories based on strings, and then supersymmetrically a superstring. And and the, the, the standard problem, the problem with this is that consistency requires um, ten dimensions. And then, the, the, but, but the vision of 1984-85 was that what you would do is you would take this, these strings moving in ten dimensions, and you would make six of the dimensions very small um, using a special type of six-dimensional geometry, and then you would get an effective Supergravity theory of the kind that Hawking wanted, but without the problems of it, and um, and that would be your unified theory. But the, um, the, the, the so, so, so the problem, the, oh, so the vision back back then was that there were very very few known when when, they, when physicists went to talk to mathematicians about what you know are these six what kind of six dimensional manifolds are there, 
of the right kind, Matt and Patrick should have said, well, we only know of a few different ones. And, um, and they, they, they knew about seven, seven different families of them, which, but, they, but they're parameterized by various um, spaces, spaces which, de, which describe, describe them. And the plan back then was just to pick a family, find the dynamics that, 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 that fixes these parameters, which tell you about the size and shape of the thing, and then you and get the standard model, and then we'd, we'd all be done. That would be, that would be the end of it. Now, so, so the, the, the problems are, one is that uh, this is where there's a lot of interaction with mathematicians, and mathematicians, mathematicians do a lot about these six-dimensional spaces. Um, people just, as people look at this, they kept on finding more and more of them. So instead of seven families now, there are hundreds of thousands of families known. Um, it, it's actually unknown if the number of families is even, is, is even finite. And then, and, and then for each, um, as, as people better understood what you would need to do with the six dimensions to try to get something that looks like, like the physics we know, to get rid of the six dimensions and only have four left, they just found more and more possible ways of doing this. And currently, for, there's some estimate that for each family of these Flavi Avs, you can find 10 to the 272,000 different kind of possible ways of putting physics on them and making and recovering our, our known physics. And so, so from my point of view, I, I argue that the problem with this is that what's happened since 1984 is that, you know, whatever you thought of this original theory, just, things have just moved in the wrong direction since then. Instead of there being some limited number of possibilities, which, which, which might look like physics, you find that as you try and create something that looks, looks like physics, you just end up with more and more and more possibilities and, and uh, really nothing, not nothing much. So, so the fundamental problem of the theory, I'd say, is that, you know, you, you it looks like it looks like if, if, if this all works out, you can get you can get not just not just what we know as as our physics at accessible energies, but you can get anything you want. And so the, so you end up totally unable to predict anything because the theory does, it, it is consistent with it with anything. And um, maybe to just kind of quickly say kind of what you know what this uh, what the source of the problem is. This may get a little bit technical. Um, the point is that string theory is it general, generalizes a single particle quantum field theory. If you think about a single quantization of a single particle and you change to thinking about a, a, vibra a, a vibrating loop, you get string theory. But, but the problem is that our, 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 our best theories are really, um, and you can get an analog of the single particle theory to find the diagrams, but, but, but what you don't get is um, what what we already have in the standard model, which is a quantum field theory, which is a, a theory which just describes many particle states. It can describe an arbitrary number of particles. And so if you want to do this, you have to, you're, you're going to need a, uh, a non-perturbed string or a string field theory. And this is something which, which to this day doesn't exist. And this is, you know, maybe I'm going to go this right quickly. So, so the, the, a lot of the subject, subject has been governed by a speculation that was made in 1995 that there was some conjectural non perturbative theory um, called M theory, which had various properties. And then since then, there's, there's, um, there's, there's some new ideas that have come out of it, which actually are, are helpful for understanding various things. But they don't, but, but they don't, in all cases, they don't actually help with the, with the too many possibilities problem. They just make it worse. And the um, next thing to say is that the, uh, the current situation is there, it's, a, it's a theory. String theory really isn't a theory, but it's a conjecture. There's a and in typical summary talk by the leaders of the field, you know, they, they, they'll often admit that the big questions are, you know, what is the theory? What are, we don't know what our theory is, we don't know what the symmetries are. And, 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 and the thing that I spend far too much of my time reality against, I should quickly go through here, is that the, for, for many people, string theory that kind of ended up in this, uh, with this vision, which is not of identifying a single geometrical structure which would explain everything, but by saying that, well, you know, there's there's so many of them, so you can get anything you want, and then then, but 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 this just means that you know before the Big Bang, um, some some whatever happened Big Bang just happened to populate the um, our universe to to, be, to 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 look the way it looks, it looks what we see, and that that's all the explanation you're ever going to have for why why we're seeing what we're seeing, and so you have this idea of bubbling. Of the, the universe bubbling into different baby universes with different physics, and and we, we and our problem is that we could we could be anywhere. The theory doesn't tell us where we are, so we can't ever tell you any any, any we can't ever predict anything. And the um, 
And anyway, this and this is just the, the rant, which I really run out of time to give anyway. But the, but there really is there really is no theory that, that could actually tell you how this is really supposed to work, how what these possibilities are, exactly are, and how they're going to get populated, and, and what what's going to happen. So you, there there is a, a real danger that you know you, this is a subject. String theory has become a subject where there there isn't a theory. There's just a hope that a theory exists and that it can't be tested, and really and really actually isn't kind of science. And, and, and the, the reason that I start to become more and more annoyed about this is that there is, you, at, while this is going on, you also see string theory even entering into some textbooks. And what I won't put on the slide, or maybe shouldn't be recorded, is that I'm, I'm not too happy that my own university, Columbia University, the physics department, actually has an undergraduate course in string theory at this point. So we're still teaching students that this is a great idea you should pay attention to when it's, um, it's kind of degenerated into something that tests them. <coughs> Anyway, and, and, and this is not exactly great for a public <coughs> that you're trying to convince about the, uh, the reliability of science. Anyway, and it also, the, the other effect of it is it, it's also kind of discourages people from, you know, working on, the, on these problems that, that, that the theory poses because you're being taught that here's a reason why the, you, you, you can never get an answer to this problem. But isn't it true that uh, the mathematics developed in string theory is now being used in other branches of physics, so yes. that it's become a, a part of mathematics. Yeah. You know, it started out that way, yeah. uh, part of astronomy or cosmology, or whatever you want to, uh, quantum theory. But it's now become a part of mathematics that's being applied to other yeah. fields. At least that claim is being. Made. <coughs> let me. Let me. The, the next slide is. I'll start to talk about mathematics. And I'll start from a somewhat different point of view, but, but you know, yeah, that, that's a, a, a really important question, and it's true that the relationship between string theory and mathematics is a complicated, really interesting subject. But but it might be better if I if I start. The problem is that I can't. I can't. It, it, would, it would take it would take a very large amount of time to actually say anything intelligent about that. So let me start going. Just before you about start, that. that I do have a question. Um, yeah. Recently, there's been measurements that indicate possibly the existence of a fourth neutrino. That is the um, sterile neutrino, etc. This reflects back to measurements made years ago that indicate. Yeah. What is your opinion? Where no, no, I, 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 is this Susie or is it? Where does this? There, there's no be? reason that that should have anything to do with Susie or Green Unified Theory. I actually think that that, that is fascinating because when, when you look into, um, if you look into the extension of the standard model you have to do to get neutrino masses, you basically have to introduce a right-handed neutrino or something. It depends how you. Make the sterile neutrino. Do you make is it a different generation or is it something different behavior of the right-handed parts? There are many, many possibilities. But, but it, that I think is, if I had to say, what's the most promising direction which you will see that the standard model breaks and there is something new there? I, I would, you know, that 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 would be my best guess. I, mean, I think there's, there's definitely things we don't understand about neutrinos, and, 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 and they are experimentally accessible. Okay, but yeah, so, 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 so the point here after all this rant was to then delete the fact that, okay, well, if, you, if, if you're stuck in a subject that doesn't really have the suffering because of a lack of you know, a new hints from, from experiment about what to do, well, you might want to look at what I've spent, the field I spent a lot of the rest of my life in, which is in mathematics. And in um, and, and mathematics, so it, it has some of the same difficulties. It, it, there's been this huge success over the years, and we've had more and more powerful um, theories in mathematics, um, and you know, and easier things get solved. You find more things get hard, get harder. But but the subject really has kind of made a lot of progress. Continue to make a lot of progress. And in recently, 1994, there was a proof of Fermat's last theorem. 2003, a proof of the quark rate conjecture. So during this period when kind of energy physics has been suffering, mathematics you know, has gone through a, has remained quite healthy and 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 seen a lot of the fall of a lot of these great. Old problems that had have been around for a long time, and the um, and so, so what I'd like to argue is that is that you know abstract mathematics it's possible that ideas from mathematics can actually inspire you to figure out how to improve these theories these theories instead of just experiments. And one precedent is actually is, uh, is Einstein's development of general relativity. General relativity is a theory that really wasn't developed because of any uh, experimental. Necessity, but it was it, it was developed because by, by thinking about the internal structure of the of the theory and by and by actually using a fair amount of mathematics. Einstein was an 
close communication with some of the best mathematicians of the, of the, of the era around him. But, um, and when he was discovered, discovered the field equations, you know, he was in discussion with this with Hilbert, and you can even argue, there's even some argument about who first came up with them, whether Hilbert or Einstein, but they certainly were talking about this. And, 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 you know, and this, so this is kind of a, a great example, a, a, an inspirational example of what, what math may be able to do for, for physics. And then there's a kind of caricatures that I want to, and so this is kind of what, when I started out as a, as a physicist, and I, no, no, actually this is what my, co my colleagues tell, tell, me, tell me about, is that they, they often tell me they started out in physics, and, then, and they couldn't stand it, like after they took public case, they couldn't just figure out what these people were exactly saying, so they better become a mathematician, and, and this is what they often think of physicists. And what physicists often think of mathematicians is what, I remember thinking mathematicians, but I was a physicist. But there are people who just make these pedantic, <laughs> or, or these completely abstract nonsense, and they're totally wrong, whatever, totally interesting, and, 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 and whatever they write is completely unreadable. I know it's the way I thought. So, so these are the two caricatures, and there's unfortunately some truth to both of them. Anyway, but, but, but one thing about that I do want to say is positive on mathematics is that the other side of this epsilon delta uh, obsession that there, there's a feeling that there's a there's a culture that you have to be extremely clear about about what your assumptions are. You know, what exactly are you saying? What exactly are you assuming? What exactly are you thinking? And this is not something physicists often don't do. And also, exactly what's the lo logic of an argument? If you say that from from this this follows, or from this I want to do this, you have to make the logic extremely clear, clear exactly exactly why this is going to work. And then the other thing is that there's a, a very a real also an obsession between the boundary of what you understand precisely and what you don't understand precisely. What you, what you can prove, what you don't quite yet know how to prove. And knowing exactly what that boundary is, is a very kind of a powerful part of, of the field. It, it means that people are, um, anyway, the, the, um, you, 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 can, you can tell what progress is, but if you know where the boundary is, you can tell if you're making progress if you push the boundary in the right direction. If you're not sure what the boundary of it, is between what we understand and what isn't, it's, it's much harder to tell when you made progress. And anyway, and so my, my argument is kind of this, is that the, is that the um, you know, there is a, a danger in this, you get lost in technicalities, and the best mathematicians don't, don't get lost in technicalities, but um, some do. And f physics has, has always never, has really never needed to kind of worry too much about these things. You could just not worry too much about exactly what the argument was, but kind of keep going, and keep calculating, and, and hope that you would make contact with experiments someday. And, um, but I think what you're seeing now with string theory and the multiverse is kind of often an extreme example of where you've got a whole structure built of unclear assumptions and speculation built upon unclear assumptions and, and getting to the point where you actually can't do anything. And, um, but then, I, then also, I think this is maybe just kind of a, my own philosophical feeling that the uh, that, 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 that the deep new ideas about mathematics, about physics, are you know are, are really often very closely related. The two subjects at some deep level are have some kind of unity. And um, this is just some historical examples to try to argue for this. One, what, what, what is the um, in you know, Romani Japanese of general activity, um, through the group representations of the quantum mechanics, the index theorem, the mathematics, closely related to the Dirac equation. Your connections to mathematics and the angles theory. If you know some of the subjects, at least you, maybe you can see you can see that these are important big ideas in physics were related to important ideas in mathematics which came around at the same time or sometimes even earlier. And, and to, the, to the present day, so one example is um, just an example on kind of present day. And this is related. And there's an interesting aspect of this that, is that some is that there's some relation to this whole story to, to, to string theory, to the mathematics of people studying string theory. There's a there's a a, super, a variant of the superspectric standard model, which is called twisted, it turns out to give you uh, truly amazing mathematics. The, the observables of this theory turn out to be um, invariants the topology of four-dimensional spaces, and this kind of revolutionized math mathematics back in from years ago. Okay, so then, Jim, this, some, some lessons that you draw from this is that, what, what you, that is it, this is often what, what, what my argument with physicists is, is that you, um, even if, the standard, if your standard prejudice is that something is a hard technical problem, and so there's no point, but there's no, it's just technical, there's no point to really trying to, trying to precisely solve it. And you may be doing something wrong, and there's 
a couple of standard examples I have for experts and of things which, um, in my experience, if you try and look into them deeply into the structure of the standard model, you find that these particular technical issues um, have never been properly understood. Mm -hmm. And so, and the standard argument from one physicist would be, well, it doesn't matter because if you do properly understand these technical issues, you'll just have understood a technical issue. Who cares? But you never know. Maybe there's something there. And um, and the other thing is just to, uh, again, to, to try to exploit the unity between deep mathematics and deep fundamental physics and try to better understand mathematical structures between the standard model and, and then what mathematicians know about them. And so you know, the, the rest of this, I think, uh, is really just a, two advertisements. Instead of trying to start to tell you something positive and here's some interesting mathematics and something that may do something, let me just give you two quick advertisements for it. But one is um, an advertisement for the idea that the theory of group representations is fundamental to the structure of quantum mechanics and, and a place to look for inspiration. And, and, and there's a lot more to it than just kind of giving some Hamiltonian figuring out what its symmetries are and, and trying to help use those to help you do calculations. There's a lot more to the subject. I, I taught a course for undergraduates for a couple of years and um, ended up writing a book based upon this. And so it's a fairly technical book aimed at kind of advanced undergraduate level students in math mathematics or physics and trying to explain the quantum theory from the big point of view of the theory of groups and representation theory. So if you have any interest in all this, um, you can get this. And then one thing to say about it is you can, you can, you can pay Springer for a nice hardcover copy of this, but you can also download the copy from my website, which is, which is just, just, uh, just as good. What exactly do you mean when you say that it gives more than just symmetry for the inventory? Do you mean that it gives us symmetry of the states? Uh, yeah, 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 yeah. So somebody is, 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 is telling me I have seconds left, so let, let me just finish and then we can. <laughs> so let me just finish. And yeah, and this is just the URL, so you can find this on my website. And the, the, the other advertisement is for um, a more technical thing. That it, 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 there's a, um, mathematicians have found that when they, st when they, when they study group representation theory from, them, from their own point of view, they, um, that the, 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 something which turns out to be the draw operator actually appears. Within this purely abstract mathematical mathematics, which seems to have nothing to do with physics, and uh, this is something that's really kind of fascinated me. And there's a whole subject among people who work on this called Dirac homology. And so uh, I've been working on on this, and hopefully within the next few months, I'll have a, a paper trying to explain what this has to do with with physics and what physicists call the BRSD form. I'm quite excited about how about that idea. But again, there's really no time to try to explain this here, but I can. There are some old notes about Dirac homology. Again, you can probably find on my website or my blog. But it, if you wait a few months, I actually understand that a lot better, and hopefully, they'll be able to explain that. Um, I guess and, and anyway, and, and then, so, so this is then, then just to summarize the the idea that I've kind of ar argued is that you know these these speculative ideas that have gotten a lot of attention over the last three or four years that really haven't worked out, and the real the serious danger that they've led to is that they've they led to these untestable. Um, this idea that maybe these are true, but, but, but there's no way to ever test them, and so you just have to give up. Um, and the, um, the, the, as I start out, the technological barriers are really starting to make it impossible to do what you've historically done for making progress in this field, and look at looking to uh, mathematics for, you know, math it's maybe a much harder way of making progress, but it may be the only way you have. And, um, and, and, and in a more positive sense, I want to argue that that I a lot more time. I think we'll expect to talk for another hour about the group representations and why why they were the right thing to be thinking about. And um, and, and, and the uh, and, and the general idea is that the, the standard model actually may be something you know actually quite close to, to a truly unified theory. I think a lot of what people are trying to do in physics now is to try to throw out the standard model and start with something different and do that. But it, it may be that you're actually very very quite clo quite close. I mean, with with some inspiration from um, some more advanced mathematics about about this, you may actually uh, be able to get some. So that's that's it. Thank you, and uh, maybe have some questions. Thank you. So my question, uh, yeah, maybe start with two ones you, you guys asked already. Um, but either yeah, either, either one or you could. Yeah, maybe, should, should, maybe, maybe I should say something first about string theory and mathematics. Is that, that you're, you're, you're asking about it. So the, I mean, 
this, it, it, it's certainly true that string theory has had a there, there, there's, been, there, there's been a lot of interaction between string theory and mathematics. I mean, there are various things to say about it. One, one thing to say about it is that it, um, the pro, the, one, one, one aspect of it has, has always been that what's happened is that you know, as ideas about string theory haven't worked, string theorists have tried, you know, tried to go in different directions, and they've, they've clearly been wandering around kind of a very rich, a space which is rich in new mathematical questions. So a lot of what's come out of string theory Somewhat, somewhat kind of string theory from mathematicians are just people asking a lot of questions which mathematicians have never thought to ask about. And then some people have gone to see mathematicians, and there's been some very fruitful interaction between the two, you know, with mathematicians learning if there's some new interesting thing to think about they hadn't. And, and um, so this whole story about Calabi Owls is one of them. Before string theory, very little was known about these Calabi Owl manifolds. Nobody had really worked too hard on them, and now a huge amount is known about them. Um, there, there, there's also some, some, some but, 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 but the, the other aspect of that is that everything that this new mathematics has taught you about the subject has just made the original physics problem worse. It hasn't solved the problem, it's made it worse. Um, there, there, there's some more, one of the complexities of the subject is that you know, as string theory has kind of evolved, it's gotten farther and farther away from this um, story that I was originally telling you. So if you invite a string theorist next week to tell you what's wrong with my talk, one thing he'll tell you is that, oh, you know, we've evolved beyond that, that picture that, that, that he was explaining that we started out with in 1984, and we had these much, much more different ideas about how things might work. Um, and, 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 anyway, but, but these, these ideas are, so, 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 anyway, the, 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 there is a lot of speculation about what string theory might be now, and about what its relation to quantum field theory might be. And it's actually kind of reached the point when you talk to somebody who says they're a string theorist, you know, they may never have actually worked on, on, a, on any actual theory of strings or worked on any of the strings. But actually what they're doing is they're actually, what they're really doing is they're working on problems in quantum field theory that, are, that, are, that have kind of been inspired by thinking about string theory. And so my argument would be more be that, you know, there is a huge amount of rich mathematics there in which deep mathematics, the relation between math and physics, embodied in better understanding quantum field theories. And a lot of what's getting, some of what's getting, what people are it's getting advertised as being mathematics coming out of string theory as well. It's really, and it was started by a question in string theory, but it ended up being a, really a question about, about a quantum field theory rather than string theory. So, so that's a little bit about that, but it's, it's, it's kind of a fascinating history of how the two subjects have interacted. Does that answer? Kind of yes, it does. <laughs> So my question, what exactly do you mean that the knowledge of groups and their presentations uh, was more than just knowledge about the state of this or the kind of thing? Yeah, so, so yeah, actually, what, what, maybe a simple example that people, if you have some fun mechanics, you may be able to appreciate. It, 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 if you just take the, um, you take the theory of a free particle moving three dimensions, three, three dimensions. Okay, so this has, this, this, the, the, the Hamiltonian, you know, p squared over 2m has um, translation symmetries, and, 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 and those, those lead to conservation of momentum, and, and it has rotational symmetries, those lead to conservation of angular momentum. If, if, if it's, got a, it, it, it's also got a, a phase symmetry, which is a, a U1 symmetry, if you like, a charge, if you like, a charge. So those are symmetries in the Hamiltonian. But, but you also have, there, there, there's, a, there's a different structure which is not a symmetry of the Hamiltonian. There, there's some extra. There, there, there's, some, there's another some other group actions you can think about. And, and the simplest thing to do is, is, to, is to realize that if you've got um, that often when you're dealing with a theory of a free particle, you often want to Fourier transform, right? And so when you Fourier, if you Fourier transform your notion of, of momentum or of translation in in position space, you get you get a notion of, you get position variables which, you get, which generate translations of momentum space, okay? So, so, those, so, 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 so those are examples of what I would say. Those are really important things, that, things to think about. It's very important to think about the position operator and what, what it's doing and what symmetry is it, and, and, and to think of that as, as generating a, an action on the space of states and everything. But that's not a symmetry of the Hamiltonian. You know, translations in momentum space are not symmetries of the, of the Hamiltonian. But, and and there's, there's an underlying group. If you put together position, you know, positions and, um, and, 
you know, positions and, and momenta, you put them together, you get um, this, this group, the Huffington called Heisenberg, which mathematicians call the Heisenberg group, and physicists sometimes call it the bio group. But it, it's this larger, non commutative group, and that is really kind of fundamental to the structure. That, that's what gives you the Q, the commutator of Q and P is, is IH bar. That, that really is a Lie algebra relation, and it's not the Q and P operators, you know, the P operator corresponds to the symmetry of the Hamiltonian, and the Q operator doesn't. So that's the simplest example. You were born as a particle physicist, so um, and the, you may have mentioned here that I can't resist asking. You quoted Einstein and his inspiration from mathematics. There was a paper in the last couple of months that appeared in the archive. Uh, I can't remember the author. A single author. It's 20 pages long, and he starts it off by saying the inspiration from Einstein was when he was looking at general relativity and the constant. He gave it negative mass as his first, um, that, that was his first bet. Then he reformulated it and then changed uh, the lambda to be just a mathematical constant. Well, this paper, which is starting to get a lot of attention, is claiming two things, that dark matter and uh, the dark energy can be explained in terms of negative mass in both cases. Einstein also thought initially that uh, his equations implied negative mass, which was repulsion. Have you had a chance to look at that? Or not, not really. I mean, I, I vaguely remember seeing something like that, but it, I, I have to confess that you know, dark energy and dark matter are things which I <laughs> almost try to avoid thinking about for a couple of reasons. One is that I'm very well aware that while I was a kid, I, I knew a lot about astronomy and about, but now I actually don't. So the I don't want to even try and I would not pretend to tell anybody what is actually known about dark matter, you know, or can it be a modification of Einstein's equation, can it not? There's a huge, there's this, a huge amount of study of this problem now, which I'm not very expert on. Similarly about dark energy, what can you do and what can you not do? And um, there, there's also just, the, the, I mean, the list of kind of speculative proposals about how to think of, what's the right way to think about dark matter and dark energy is just, is just so endless that, um, you know, it's hard to say anything. I certainly don't feel comfortable saying anything much about any particular one of them, which I know nothing about. The one that always seemed to me the most promising was, was purely the um, about that you could somehow get dark matter as being due to these sterile neutrinos to right-handed neutrinos, because that would at least kind of correspond to some hole in the standard model, which I knew about. And, and something like well, what he is doing is essentially resurgence of oil. Who you speak like well, speak well. Oh, sorry. Uh, it's almost like a resurgence of Foyle, Narlikar, and Shama in the sense that not only does he want uh, negative mass to explain this, but he has the creation of negative mass popping into the universe very much the way the steady state cosmologists did. It was published in Astronomy and Astrophysics. And it, 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 my, my feeling, my problem with getting interacted with any of these ideas is just I'm, I'm, I'm just too aware that there's, there's a very, very long history of attempts to do things like this and exactly, you know, what's been done, why it doesn't work, how it butts up against what's known experimentally, and what the theoretical problems are requires a lot of expertise I don't have to interact with sense of. Uh, I may add confusion. Um, I, I submit that it helps or would help to have been born at the right time. Uh, yes. I was born too early, uh, in 1934. <laughs> um, I had Stephen Weinberg and a semester course on Lagrangian field theory at Columbia. Oh, okay. he went to Cornell and stuff. This is one, one of Columbia's <laughs> huge mistakes was not keeping him at Columbia. But anyway. one, of the, one of the worst mistakes in the Columbia Physics Department was not, not keeping, keeping him at him. Yeah. Oh, Amen. I've come to that thing. <laughs> they agreed. Now, um, so I, I got an A in the course. I felt I understood Lagrangian field theory as he had it formulated at that time. <clears throat> but I didn't know what to do with it. Uh, and so I did an experimental thesis. Um, I have not since covered, uh, acquired st the standard model because I was born too damn early <laughs> and I, uh, I haven't read the right book or I haven't heard the right lecture. Uh, I've heard some lectures on it and they get sort of results, but they don't get you from here to there. Yeah. Uh, so, 
so I'm sort of disappointed in this situation in full. Now, let's set that aside. My friend Harold Williams down here has some attractive ideas. He thinks that um, space time is pixelated. Um, what's the gentleman's name I'm looking for? You know, well, Max Planck, and he's a Planck, that's 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 right. Planck of Planck time, that's right. even before special or general right. activity. Right. Now, if, 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 if space time is pixelated, we can envisage, and this is me now, I'm not sure whether Harold, how much of this Harold lived during the fourth. Um, it might consist of being visualized as little tetrahedrons, three dimensions of space and one of time. And by the time you go around three corners of a, of a, um, uh, a tetrahedron, uh, I've seen a math formulation that uh, is my friend uh, Alan Gromborski developed. It, it can't close if you're in a higher dimension. Yeah. Uh, so the failure to close is a time increase. Yeah. Right. I, mean, I, I, I really just I'm say, what, what I, it's kind of, kind of the point I was actually trying to, to make here is that there, there, there's a huge, I mean, there's a long history, and, and now even more, there's, there's a, let's just let me say this way, there's a long history of, of people trying to come up with new ideas about how to think about how would you quantize space and time? What is how do you do this? And, and, and doing it in very speculative ways. Um, the weird thing, I think, about recent history was that kind of speculation, typically most um, conventional or, or well-established particle theorists, the people at the Institute in Princeton, they would say, look, you know, that that's never gone anywhere, that's not well, precise. It's actually accessible to experiment because the, the, the edges are so damn tiny. Anyway, so, 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 so there's always been a prejudice against that. The, the weird thing that's actually happened now is that you, if you go and look and see what's happening at a prince, like this week they're having a, a conference on, you know, can you think about space time in terms of quantum information theory? Yeah. And, and to, to, be, to, to be completely honest, I feel like this is all of my attempts to look at any of these things. I've just never, I've never seen anything that looks at all like the really powerful, really well-tested, really beautiful things at the base of the standard model. And until somebody shows me something which hooks up to something I actually understand, which I have evidence for, I'm going to let them do it and, and, and ask me so to do it. Um, you were born too early also. <laughs> no, yeah, but, but I, I was actually born actually in, in, in the precise the right time. I mean, the, the one thing on my career, you could see that, so I came to to college in 1975 and started learning about physics, and it was exactly after the standard model had, was already in place. So, so I, unlike you, instead of having to integrate all the stuff I learned with the standard model, I hadn't learned anything yet, so I could just say, oh, it's a standard model. So <laughs> I could just sit down and start learning the standard model as a freshman. That's what I'm to do. And that's what, uh, that was the advantage of my age. <laughs> you know, it's interesting you mentioned Weinberg. Um, in the January, I think, 17th, 2017 issue, of the New York Review of Books. He has written an essay. It's a very interesting essay. And uh, he's sort of taken the title of the essay, reminds one of Lee Smolin's book, The Problem with Physics, uh, The Trouble with Physics. And the title of his essay is The Problem with Quantum Mechanics. And uh, he does mention the fact, you know, the current issue uh, with Everetti and whether this interpretation means that at every observation, uh, millions of new universes get created, which some argue is the natural interpretation of quantum mechanics, period. That's the way it takes it out, and that goes back to 56. But if I've read that article correctly, he seems to be a little bit concerned about quantum mechanics itself, and this is from the Nobel Prize winner on weak interaction in the end. Uh, so there is a lot of concern, yeah. I think, now about so that do we really understand yeah. and what are the implications? I should say yes. I mean, this is something I've, I've ended up thinking about a bit, partly because it's come up on my blog and I've ended up discussing it with people on my blog. And partly when I was writing this book, I had to, to think about, okay, I'm explaining this, these mathematical structures, and this, but you know, I do need to say something about how you connect up these mathematical structures to what you observe and what the self measurement problem. And so I, I anyway, I, what, what, the, the, the thing that I found the more I studied the measurement problem is the more you just, at some point, you, you become more and more confused and it becomes un, unclear to you whether there really is a problem. And, that, and, that, and, and certainly for everything that I was trying to do with, with mathematics and quantum mechanics, that was completely disjoint from anything, whatever the possible problem with measurement was. So 
So I, I haven't, it hasn't interacted with anything that I actually, where I actually feel I actually know something and can, can, can say something interesting. But on the other hand, and the more and more I spend time thinking about it, it's a fascinating problem of what, but I think it really is the problem of how does the classical, our classical world, model of the world emerge out of some underlying fundamental laws. And, and if you start thinking about it, it's a very, very hard, even technically, it's a very, very hard problem. It tends to the 20 whatever particles interacting and when you're doing, if you're actually doing a measurement, you're doing something very, very complicated in terms, as a quantum mechanical system. And why that should look at all like classical mechanics is very hard to understand. And you know, I, I think Weinberg has a long history of being concerned about this, but and try, trying various things to try to that would resolve the problem. One is to introduce nonlinearities in the Schrodinger equation. But I think even he admits that you know nothing that he's tried has really kind of you know, has kind of worked or, or really helped. So it seems to want to want an explosive reality, which, uh, which I find in, in your words uh, also. Um, but but uh, you know, whereas what we sense is really a very smooth. Yeah, no, the, the problem is, yeah, our, what we, what we, evolution and our, and, and growing up and experiencing the world, but what this tells us the world is like is actually doesn't really look like atomic I, I, I think the, maybe one interesting thing that will happen in the future is that as people design quantum computers and try to make larger and larger structures, which were, where you have some kind of coherent quantum phenomena going on, and you actually spend a lot more time you know, interacting with the, those the, the problems of understanding what those things are doing and how the classical world you're in is interacting with this quantum world in your um, you find this business of qubits attractive? I do not. Uh, the, the thing is, each unit, uh, if you have this uh, spin with two states, yeah. uh, each unit gives another power of, of two, yeah. and uh, the uh, complication of uh, the systems you, you made the model. Now, suppose you get three. Well, it's exponential, uh, and uh, uh, the, the number of different states that one elementary system can represent. But the exponential is, uh, at, at small numbers is not very, it doesn't develop very fast. I mean, eight, eight to the four is not really huge. <laughs> well, I don't know, yeah, I don't know. Anyway, well, one thing you say about that, like, if I can advertise the book, is that, you know, there, there, there's a lot, a lot of the, the first few chapters is, is all about just trying to understand this question of this. What is a what is a spin one half to the degree of what is that? And there, that, there's a fascinating mathematics behind that whole story of just that simple thing. Well, the triplet state I submit is yeah. Uh, well, there was an erroneous letter to the editor. I, I wrote a letter to the editor refuting from uh, the, the then chairman of the physics department at, at the University of Southern California, where I used to be a professor of physics. By the way, that's an accident. Uh, <coughs> but. Uh, uh, he says that um, with regard to qubits, there's an interaction between the parts of a system. At, uh, he doesn't use the word causation, but his, his wording implies that there's a causation that flows at infinite speed. Well, we know that doesn't yeah. happen. Okay. Uh, C uh, is the velocity of causation. Uh, anyway, I mean, you, 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 you're really get, getting off into <laughs> areas where we are, which are controversial and which, which I know nothing about and which are far from what I do know about, so I, I have to... I go off any any at all. So, um, I, I, I know you said you, you don't know about dark matter, but but you, you are into particle physics, I can tell. Yeah. Why is everybody assumed that dark matter is going to be basically fundamental particles shooting around as opposed to dark stars or you know? Is there any successor particle physicists that they want to answer? No, I mean, there are, it, 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 this is where, where I start to become uncomfortable. I'm going to start talking about things I don't really understand that well. I mean, the, the, you know, there is, you can ask that, you know, what if this, this matter that we're not seeing, you know, what, you know, what if it is this kind of star? What if it is black holes? What if it is, I mean, any kind of astrophysical thing you know about, you can say, well, what if it was that? And you can ask what this means for your, your best models of that astrophysical phenomenon of the observations. And the, the claim from people with some expertise in this is that, you know, what we know about dark matter is, is, is you know, ha has some inconsistency with any kind of simple version of that. With It's inconsistent with, any, any, but, but, but exactly what, why it's inconsistent and what, 
what you know what's going on with those models. I, I'm, I'm not an astrophysicist. I don't know. You have to bug me. Yeah, I, I think a few years ago, one theory was maybe it was a lot of dark Jupiters who were just floating around mm -hmm. out there. But it turns out you can come up with a statistical uh, prediction as to how often a, 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 some arbitrary star would sort of blink with one of these things moving across it, and they actually looked for them. Yeah, yeah. And, and they couldn't find that sort of prediction, yeah, so, I mean, that, so that kind of knocked that theory off, et cetera, et cetera. So not that, that was also actually my initial reaction here at Dark Matter. Yeah, well, it's just some stuff out there we haven't seen. Who cares? But, 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 yeah, then I'm told by people who know more about that, that they're actually people well, that... Well, I just remember reading about it. I think gravitational lensing. What? Gravitational lensing. You would see the yeah. lensing more often. Right, right. It makes me you wish for a real bad week. Let us thank once again our speakers.